had an incredible week of prayer um, here Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., Saturday at 9. Uh, if you weren't able to come to that, we'll be doing it in the fall. Uh, and if you'd like to preview that, we still have four, uh, five, five of our six stations still up around the room if you want to see what kind of guided prayer times we're having. Uh, the last station was right here. It was Pray for Our World. We had to move that, obviously. But, um, man, I just, I just want to thank the people who, who came to that. And, man, what, what kind of ripples might those prayers have in our church and our families and in our city and in our world. So grateful for that. And uh, we're, we're actually in a series on prayer. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, um, we've been walking through a theology of, of prayer. And we kind of ended last week with this idea of, man, when you pray, do you, um, do you hope or do you expect? Do you hope or do you expect? Um, and this is a really crucial question. Um, when I was little, seven years old, I think, um, around there, um, I remember asking God if I could fly. Now, I had read in, his, in the Word, you know, asking you shall receive, um, and whatever you ask in prayer, you'll receive if you, had, if you have faith, things like this. So I'm praying as, with as much faith as a seven-year-old knows how to have. God, I want to be able to fly. And I never, I never flew. I, 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 in fact, I even... I tried to help God out. I, I got some trash bags and I cut them open and I taped them together with duct tape and I got on the top of my fort in my backyard and I jumped off to see if maybe if I put in some of the effort, maybe God would allow me to fly. And it still never worked. And so <laughs> I know that's silly, but I begin to wonder, man, does like this prayer actually work? Like I was just trying to take God at his word as a kid. I mean, does this actually work? It says, ask and you shall receive. I was frustrated. I mean, I read things like this. Um, Whatever you ask in prayer, you'll receive if you have faith. Matthew 21, 22. Or this. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I took this one to heart too. I mean, I was little. I can remember looking at mountains and, and trying as, with as much faith as I know how to make them move. That's what it says. I mean, I remember looking, and it just wouldn't, it would never move. And what I thought was, well, it's because I didn't have enough faith. Because it says if you just believe you already have it, if you believe that it's going to happen, you know, it'll, you'll have it, it'll happen. And so I just concluded the problem was with me. Because after all, when I was praying for the mountain to move, I'd be honest, I, I did have some doubts about whether it would or not. And so that was the reason it didn't move. Because it says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you've received it and it will be yours. So the question I want to put before us this morning is simply this. When it comes to God answering our prayers, what can we really expect? When it comes to God answering our prayers, what can we really expect? Now, I'm not talking about hope here. We all know what we can hope for. I'm talking about what we can expect to happen. And, and furthermore, how does faith play a part of it? What does it mean to pray in faith? If I had more faith, would I have been able to fly? Um, if I had more faith, would the mountain have moved? If I had more faith, would my grandma not have died in 2017? What can I expect in prayer. And I cannot tell you how damaging getting the wrong answer to this question has been for so many people. In large part because of preachers who tell them that all God wants for their life is for things to be easy and wonderful and great. He's kind of like a, a genie and he just rains down blessings on your life. The prosperity gospel, Creflo Dollar said this, for example, when we pray, believing that we've already received what we are praying, God has no choice but to make our prayers come to pass. It is a key to getting results as a Christian. I hope you don't believe that. You will be so discouraged if you believe that. This is the lie that so many people believe, and it's a lie that's perpetuated by what's called the word faith movement. People influenced by it. If you just believe it, you will receive it. 
And it is not true in so many ways. And it's been damaging to so many people's faith who have prayed and prayed and prayed and they didn't get what they asked for. Prayed as hard as they could. And they're left wondering, why didn't God show up? I've been there. There's one prosperity preacher. And I'll just say false teacher. Her name is Joyce Meyer. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to offend anyone. but um, She made a stunning admission this past January. For 34 years, she's been preaching this word faith stuff. If, you know, if you're not doing well, it's because you don't have enough faith. And if this thing bad happens to you, it's because you didn't have enough faith. And earlier this year, she posted a video on her Instagram kind of retracting a lot of her 34 years of teaching. This is unbelievable. I'm not endorsing uh, Joyce Meyer. I'm not saying read her books or listen to her material. But this is an astonishing claim from a prosperity gospel teacher. Listen to this. She says this, and I quote, probably the only time I'm ever going to quote Joyce Meyer from this pulpit. I'm glad for what I learned about prosperity, but it got out of balance. I'm glad for, one, for what I learned about faith, but it got out of balance. And so every time someone had a problem in their life, it was because they didn't have enough faith. If you got sick, it's because you didn't have enough faith. If your child died, you didn't have enough faith. Well, that's not right. There's nowhere in the Bible where we're promised that we won't have any trouble. I don't care how much faith you've got, you're not going to avoid ever having trouble in your life. Jesus said, in the world there will be tribulation, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. And that is certainly a step in the right direction. And I appreciate her saying that, and I will continue to pray for her that her theology will become more orthodox. There will be tribulation. It's not going to be a carriage ride. And yet when we hear verses like, you know, believe that you'll receive it, you know, believe that you'll have it and you'll receive it, if they don't mean that you get what you're asking for, what do they mean? If ask and you shall receive does not mean you'll get whatever you ask for, what, is, what does it even mean at all? And so, I don't know that I'm going to be able to answer all your questions on this this morning, but I'm convinced that if you'll track with me for the next 30 or 40 minutes, you will walk out of here with a significantly improved framework for setting your expectations when it comes to prayer and a significantly clearer understanding of what it means to pray in faith. So, that's what we're up against this morning. So, let me, let me pray for us. Let me pray for me. Let me pray for you, and then we'll dive in here. Uh, Father, we come to you uh, the only way that we can come to you, and that is in the name of another, in the name of Jesus, who represents us before you, our righteousness, our substitute, our champion. We're grateful that we have access to you and through prayer, through the work of Jesus, and we're, and we're grateful that you've assembled us here this morning to study your word. And I pray, God, that as I preach, you would transform hearts. You would do things that only you can. God, I'm so aware that I have no power to change anyone's heart. I have never spilled a drop of blood for anyone's redemption. And so, God, I pray that you would do the work. You would help me faithfully represent your text and help us be better prayers. We ask this in the good name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you ready to dive in? So I think there's two things we need to think about when it comes to prayer, two kind of foundational, at least two foundational truths. Number one, it's in your notes. God usually, so we're asking, how does God answer prayer? God usually answers prayer through natural means, not miracles. God usually, emphasis on the usually, we believe in miracles happen, uh, that God does them. We said last week, we sang a song, you're the God of miracles. We believe miracles happen. I've seen miracles happen. No, y'all have seen miracles happen. So they happen. But God usually answers prayer through natural means, not miracles. What, what do I mean here? Well, you, you may have heard this story, but it's a great illustration that this guy hears that there's a flood coming. Okay? He's like, oh, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a flood coming, right? And, but I'm a man of faith, so I'm going to trust God to save me. So the waters rise up about three feet. Okay, and then some guy comes along in a truck, right? And he says, oh, I'll save you, man. I'll take you to dry land. That's where we're all going. And he says, no, no. I'm believing God. I'm believing and I'm receiving that he's going to save me. And so the guy's like, all right, see ya. All right, so the waters keep coming up. He starts like standing on stuff in his house, right? He's like 10 feet now. And he's, you know, just breathing. He's trusting God, though. A guy comes by in a boat. 
He's like, hey, man, I'll be happy to put you on my boat, take you to dry land. That's where we're all going. That's where it's safe. And he says, no, no, I'm a man of faith. I have asked, and I know that I will receive. God will save me. So then the water keeps going up and up. Finally, he gets on the roof of his house, all right? The water's coming up, and there's, there's this helicopter, okay, that flies over and like, throws out a ladder. Hey, man, grab the ladder. We'll take you to dry land. That's where everyone's going. It's safe there. And he says, no, no, I'm a man of faith. I am believing and receiving that God will save me. And then he dies. <laughs> he dies. And then he goes up to heaven, and he looks at God. This is not a true story. I just want to be clear, okay? Okay. Um, he goes up to heaven and he says, God, I, I, I believed and I didn't receive. I mean, you, you said that, you know, if you ask and you shall receive. And I was believing that you're going to save me. And he said, I sent you a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. Okay? I did. I kept my promises. I sent you a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. The normal way that God answers prayers is through, is through natural means. Now, we mentioned this last week with respect to how we ask God for things, but I want to spend some time this week talking about what we expect, what we expect, and how that relates to the means God uses. If I'm sitting in my home on the couch, and I say, oh God, I just read the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Oh God, I just pray that you would allow bread and fish to materialize in front of me. Or I just read the story of you know, the wilderness wanderings, and the Lord brings down manna. God, I just want manna to just boom right here at 4348 Teleco Road, just to, just to come on down. And, and, and it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. Why? Well, what, what is the means by which God has revealed that I'm going to get food, that he's going to answer my prayer for food? It's to get up, go to the refrigerator, and make something. Or go out and buy something and eat it. That's how God is designed to answer that prayer. just want to be clear. God is not designed for my food to materialize in front of my face. Is it possible? Could God do that if he wanted to? Yeah, he could. Should we expect him to? No, we shouldn't. We should expect him to work through the normal means that he has revealed in the world that he uses to work to, to, to answer prayer and accomplish things. Um, let's say, for example, um, oh, God, I, I pray that you would help me get some extra money to help me pay my rent this month. Because I had to put brakes on my car. It was an unexpected expense. And um, I'm, running, I'm not going to make rent. And instead of doing anything, you sit on the couch and hope for a check to come in the mail tomorrow for $563.49. The exact amount the mechanic said that you were going to need. Now, how's that happened to folks? I know them. I've, I've, I've heard of it happening. I mean, I really have. It happened to me, but I've heard of it happening. It's possible. Should you expect that? Like, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait for that check to come tomorrow because that's how God's going to provide. I don't think that should be your general expectation. Let me tell you the normal way God answers that prayer. It's to go to your landlord and ask for a, a short extension. And they say, okay, uh, but we're going to fine you a little bit. You say, okay. You go to your boss. You say, hey, can I work a few extra shifts? They say, yes. You work a couple shifts till midnight that week. You get the money and you pay your landlord. Did God answer your prayer? Yes, he did. He did answer your prayer to make rent. And now you may say this. Well, hold on now, Chase. That's not really God answering your prayer. Isn't that kind of you answering your prayer? You know what I'm saying? Like you went out and did all the... You did it. I mean, God didn't do it. You did it. God didn't answer your prayer. You did, you, you did all the work. And if, if we respond like this, it may indicate that when we pray... We are asking God to do something, not through us, but do something instead of us. God, just do something. I'm going to sit on the couch. I want you to do it for me. Make it happen. Totally apart from the means that you've designed for it to happen, just make it happen. I'm, I want you to work instead of me working. Not just asking for miracles. Does God, does God do miracles? Well, of course. Does God intend for the regular rhythm of your prayer life to be constantly praying for miracle after miracle after miracle in daily things like, can I have a meal? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Dean Edwards said it this way, pray and then start answering your prayer. <laughs> pray and then get to work answering it. That's how God works, natural means. How about this, 2 Thessalonians 3, a couple examples in the word. For even we are with you, we'd give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not what? Eat. 
The way that God has designed to answer your prayer, God, can I have food? Get a job, make some money, buy the food, put it in your mouth. That is how God has designed to answer that prayer. Natural means. Might he make something materialize on your plate? Man, that would be cool. If he does, I want to hear about it. But I wouldn't expect it. I wouldn't expect it. God has not revealed, God has revealed that's not how he normally works. How about Matthew 9, 38? It says this, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That, that is to, to, to preach the gospel. God does not tell us to pray, oh God, for all the people in India and you know, whoever in, in, in the 1040 window, God, I just pray that they would hear the gospel somehow. God prays for, God tells us to pray that people would be sent out to tell them the gospel. Not that it would just happen. Don't skip the process. God has designed for the gospel to advance, not just, but by people who take the gospel to the unreached. It's the means. So look, when you pray, just first kind of expectation here. When you pray, expect God to work through normal means, generally. He may work through a miracle. I hope he does. That would be very incredible. I hope you'll come to a Life 127 meeting and encourage our whole church with that. But I also pray that you'll come and encourage our church with God's what we may call ordinary faithfulness. Okay? So, so when you say, um, when, when you pray, God, um, I, ju I just want to be patient. Make, God, make me patient. Okay, that kind of sounds like you just want to wake up tomorrow and be patient. Just kind of like, boom, I went to bed, an impatient wretch. I woke up just so patient. That's not how God works. Instead, why don't you have the courage to pray this prayer this week? Tell me how different this is. God, would you give me an opportunity to learn patience this week? You think God will answer that prayer? Yes, absolutely, he will. Will you give me an opportunity to learn patience? See, we want to skip the process and get to the prize. That's not how God works. We just want to wake up and be patient. We don't want to learn patience. That's annoying. We just want to be patient. It's not how God works. Don't expect him to work like that. God, give me friends. Go in a small group. God, I pray that you would increase my faith. Help me hold on to you when everything goes away. He may bring suffering into your life. He, he may bring suffering into your life to help increase your faith. To help you lean on him more and more in ways that you would not lean on him if everything was rosy. You say, oh God, I, I have a, I'm struggling with some addiction. I'm struggling with a porn addiction. I need help. I just, I can't free myself from this. I mean, I know I should and I feel bad and all the rest, but I just, I need help. M maybe he, he causes you to get caught by someone who loves you. Bring some accountability into your life. That's how he works. It could be the best thing for you. That's the natural means by which God works. Friends coming along one side, along one, alongside one another, encouraging one another, investing in one another. So, realize God usually answers prayers through normal means. And then also when it comes to expectation, we need to understand that God often answers prayer by giving us our ultimate desire rather than our specific request. So Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly more than anything that we can ask or imagine. Anything that you can ask or imagine, man, God can do exceedingly more than that. And oftentimes he answers our prayers in a way that is exceedingly more than what we ask for, but it's not the thing we ask for. I love this uh, quote by Henry Ford. He said, um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. I would have give, just given them faster horses. And you can't blame people for, for wanting a faster horse. He's like, listen, if I would have literally just listened to what people wanted and given them what they wanted, I'd give them a faster horse that could run longer, faster. But he gave them a car. He gave them a car. Sometimes we, we pray for a horse, God gives us a car. I mean, imagine a guy in first century Palestine who's stranded on the road and he says, oh God, I pray that you would give me a horse. I pray that you'd give me a horse so I could get into town before nightfall and get some dinner. And God, and this would be a miracle, obviously, but God just goes, boom, and in front of this guy appears a Ferrari 458 Italia with 450 horsepower. Now, here's the question. Did God answer that guy's prayer? Well, yeah, but not by giving him the thing he asked for. God answered his prayer by actually giving him the thing he might have actually asked for if he knew everything God knew. 
I'll take that. Let's skip the horse. Right? And so this is how God works. Right? He often gives us the underlying desire that we're praying for, not the specific object that we're praying for. T- T- Tim Keller said it this way, and I just paraphrased it. Just, just think about how amazing this is. God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knew. God will only give you what you would have asked for anyways if you had all his knowledge. Here's what that means. One day you and I will stand with God in eternity, look back on our lives at the hardest, most confusing parts and be like, oh, that was perfectly played, God. I wouldn't have had it any other way looking back. I didn't like it then, but now I kind of see what you did there. Well played. We will only, God will only give us what we would have asked for anyways if we knew everything he knew. So with those two kind of foundations in place, I want us to move into, really, what can, answering this question, what can we expect when we pray? What can you really expect? And it's fair to say that there are really three answers, yes, no, and wait. So we're going to talk about all three. There's only no such thing as un- unanswered prayer, okay? There's only three answers. There's yes, there's no, and there's wait. So let's talk about those three answers. So when it comes to praying in your bedroom, in your quiet time, in your car ride, what can you expect? Well, I think you can expect a yes if your prayer is based on God's promises. If your prayer is based on God's promises. I'll give you an example of this. James 1.6 says it this way. If any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks wisdom, and we all lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've taken this promise to the bank. God, I need wisdom. I need wisdom. I, I cannot ever remember a time where I didn't get it. I can't ever remember a time, God, I need wisdom. I don't know how to do what you're calling me to do. Would you give me the wisdom to do it? And then walk away being like, man, God really didn't show up. I mean, I've seen this promise come true over and over and over and over again. Give me wisdom. God promises to forgive us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. You can take that to the bank. God's promises are true. You can take that to the bank. Matthew 28 says, God will be with you when you're making disciples. God, I'm terrified of sharing the gospel. Will you be with me? Yep, told you I would be in Matthew 28. Told you I would be. I will be with you as you make disciples to the ends of the earth. Luke 12, how about this? And when you... When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. I love that. So when they drag you, you get persecuted for your faith, they drag you in front of the council, you're supposed to, what, what do you want to say for yourself? Don't even worry about it. God's going to have it under control. In that moment where you need the right words, God's going to speak through you. Man, like these are promises. Man, you can take these to the bank. Expect a yes when you're praying in a way that's consistent with God's promises. And second, expect a yes if your prayer is consistent with general revelation. General revelation. That's kind of a technical term here. Usually, when we say general revelation, we mean we're, we're referring to the way that God has revealed himself in creation and the moral conscience. But here I'm using it in the way that God has revealed himself in history. That is, Um, how God has acted in history, how God has designed his world. We know something about how how God will act in his world today based on how he acted yesterday. I'll give you an example. This marker right here, if I drop it, everyone watch. Now, no one is amazed. No one's amazed because God has designed things to fall to the ground when they're dropped on earth. If they're dropped on the moon, it'd be different. But on our planet, where God has designed for us to live, he has designed that it's something that's not supported, that it, that it falls. Okay? And so, uh, for example, if you go up to another example, you go up to a lake that's perfectly smooth and you throw a rock in there, what's going to happen? Ripples. God has designed for ripples to take place when you throw a rock in there. So you can pray in a way, you can believe, I mean, truly expect a yes when it comes to um, God acting in a way that is consistent with how he has acted for thousands of years. 
uh, so for example, if you came to me and you said, Chase, I have a runny nose, will you pray for my healing? I'll say, sure. And I think I am absolutely have warrant to believe that you will be healed from that. Because we have understood that usually when someone has a runny nose, it's not terminal. You're going to take some NyQuil or some DayQuil, and you're going to get better in a couple days. Just a cold. We have reason to believe that that's how God has acted in his creation. Usually, usually, a standard cold doesn't lead to death. So I'm absolutely right to pray for your healing and expect that you will be healed. Probably even by next week. Okay? This is general revelation. We talked about it earlier about patience. You think God will answer this prayer? God, give me an opportunity to learn patience? Absolutely. How about this one? God, would you give me an opportunity this week to learn humility? You think God will answer that? So we don't want that. We, we, we don't want to be humbled. We just want to be humble. We don't, we don't want the process. We want the prize. I said it earlier. I don't want to be humbled. That's awful. But I do want to just be a humble individual. I want to wake up tomorrow and just be so humble. That's not how God works. Okay? So ask in a way that's consistent with general revelation. Not make me humble tomorrow, but God, this week, give me an opportunity to learn humility. How about for single people in the room? You're praying for a spouse. I think it's consistent with general revelation, that is the way God normally orders things, to expect that at some point and in some way, God will bring that about. Why? Because 90% of people get married at some point in their life. It's a fact. It was a fact 10 years ago. Maybe it's 85 now. But generally, people, statistics show that people who want to get married get married at some point during their life. So I think you can pray with expectation that it'll probably happen. Not, maybe not next week, but eventually. This is praying in accordance with how God has revealed that things work in the world. So now, now I realize that there's still a variety of prayers that don't fit into either one of these categories. Okay? They're not, it's not general revelation. It's not a promise of God. We're going to talk about those towards the end. But expect a yes to your prayer. Expect a yes if it's based on a promises of God. And expect a yes generally if it's consistent with general revelation. That is how God orders the world. So... We expect a yes for those things, but let's move to the no. There are a few prayers that you should pray, or, or actually you shouldn't pray, but when you pray them, you should expect a no. You should expect a no. Expect a no if your prayer is contrary to God's word. Just go ahead and expect a no. God, I pray that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm stealing from my employer or as a business operator, I'm being unethical. I just pray that you'd bless us. We're making so much money. God, I'm in a sexual relationship with someone who's not my wife, but it's just so much fun. Would you bless our relationship? Now, these are things that just go explicitly against God's word, and he won't bless something that his word condemns. So, in fact, you can just save so much time, by the way. You don't even have to pray for that kind of stuff. You can just skip all that and get to, the, <laughs> get to other things. God's never going to bless something that he condemns in his word. And when it comes to his word, God gives us um, some specific um, instruction when it comes to what may hinder our prayers. Let me give you two examples. The first one is um, to men. 1 Peter 3, 7 says this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Why, why should we do this? So that your prayers may not be hindered. If you don't live with your wife, I'm talking to the men, the husbands, in an understanding way, you probably don't have a very good prayer life. I guarantee it. Peter is explicitly telling husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Well, she's just emotional and she's irrational. And she's not. Listen, you better try to understand her. You better try. So I can't do it. You better try. Or your prayers are going to be hindered. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Live, your wife, live with your wife in an understanding way. So your prayers are not hindered. That's for men. And the second one is for all of us. Psalm 16, uh, 66, 18 says this. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. What does that mean? It means this. If you're living a sinful lifestyle, if you're living in a way that is inconsistent with what God has revealed in his word, you should not expect God to answer your prayers. If you're, if you're just kind of doing your own thing in life, and I know the Bible says this, and God and Jesus, but you know what? This is more fun over here. I'm just going to do this. Don't expect God to answer your prayers. If you're, if you're loving the thing that God condemns, says not to do, if you cherish iniquity in your heart, he won't listen. Again, I'm just trying to be practical here. I'm not trying to offend anyone, step on anyone's toes. But I'm just saying, like, if you're living in a way that's inconsistent with God's holiness, don't expect him to bless your life and answer your prayers. 
could be more clear. Psalm 66. Okay? So, expect to know if your prayer is contrary to God's word. And then expect to know if your prayer is inconsistent with general revelation. This is the other side of the coin that we just talked about a few minutes ago. Now, again, when I say general revelation, I mean we're... In this context, we're we're talking about what we can know about God today based on how he acted yesterday and the day before and the day before. Um, So I said earlier, if I drop this pen, it'll fall. Watch again. Okay. Now, what if I pray in faith that it won't fall? What if I pray in faith and it won't fall and I just believe that I've received it and all the rest? If it falls to the ground... I mean, I'm believing. I am praying. I am believing it won't fall. If it falls to the ground, is that because I had a lack of faith? I didn't believe hard enough. If I'd have believed, I would have received. The answer is no. It's not. Honestly, if you want to fulfill that prayer, I need to go to the moon. That would be a natural means of fulfilling that prayer. Seriously. You go to the moon. Sure, I'll let you do that. Get on a spaceship. I'll let you experience that. But not on earth. Because God has revealed that this is the way he's ordered his creation. Gravity. And actually, when we, when we kind of force God into a miracle, the Bible calls it putting him to the test. Satan tried to do it with Jesus, took him up to the top of the temple. He said, you know, you're the chosen one, you're going to redeem folks. Why don't you just jump off the temple and God will save you. He'll command his angels concerning you. And Jesus responds with scripture from Deuteronomy 6, don't put your Lord your God to the test. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. What does that mean? It means don't try to work God in this situation where he's forced to do a miracle outside of how he naturally works. Oh, God, I know this is how you, you normally do things day after day after day after day. But I'm asking you to suspend the natural order for, for me in this moment. It's not impossible. But it shouldn't be the regular rhythm of your prayers and expectations. And I feel like, for so many of us, this is how we pray. God, I know I didn't pay attention in class or study for the test, but I just pray I'd make a good grade. <laughs> God, I know I'm living a lifestyle that I can't afford, buying a lot of stuff, going on a lot of trips, having a lot of nice stuff, but I just pray that you'd help me pay my bills. We, we had a guy when I was at First Baptist, he came to our benevolence ministry, he drove like a $35,000 truck, was asking for help with his cell phone bill. No, dude, sell your truck. You're living above your means. There's no reason you should buy a $35,000 truck and not be able to make a $150 cell phone payment for your smartphone. Or just get a flip phone. This is someone living above their means. Still wants to pay the bills. Look, in my observations, I've found that many of our prayers really do this. They ask God to suspend the way that he's designed creation to work. That's just usually not how God operates. If you don't study for the test, you don't pay attention in class, God has revealed through general revelation that your grade will be worse than it would be if you studied and paid attention. If you live above your means and buy stuff you can't afford and go on all these vacations and and whatnot, and you can't afford to do them, what God has shown us is that you're going to experience financial stress and may struggle to pay some bills. It's just how it is. So let me bring this point home for you. What about someone who has stage four cancer that is highly metastasized? Highly metastasized, I mean, brain, heart, I mean, everything. Let me ask you this question. What has God shown if he brings someone to the point of highly metastasized stage four cancer that he usually plans to do next? He plans, he has revealed over and over and over again that he usually plans to take that person home. Not always. Not always. We pray for healing. Man, we pray for healing. God, do a miracle. Save, heal. You're the great physician. And we pray for that. But God has shown over and over and over again that when he brings someone to that point, and I do mean he brings them to that point, we believe in a sovereign God, that his design for them is to go home and to heal him fully and finally. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know what, Chase? It says you don't have, you just don't have faith. That represents a lack of faith. In other words, if I go and I pray for someone to be healed, and then you kind of, who has like a highly metastasized form of uh, cancer, you know, stage four, all the rest, 
Um, and you kind of got me in a, in a room and you said, hey, Chase, I know you prayed for them to heal, be healed, but do you, uh, do you think they actually will be? What I would tell you is I, I sure hope they will be, but I don't think so. There are people in this room who say, well, that's just a lack of faith. And if you don't expect it to happen, ex- expectation, if you don't expect God to work in this moment, not hope, but expect God to work in a way that is utterly contrary to how he normally works, it's a lack of faith. And I would simply say, no, it's not. You and I are putting our faith in two different things. You and I are putting our faith in two different things. You're putting your faith in a specific result. I'm putting the object of my faith as a person. So let me, let me just be so clear. What it means to pray in faith this morning. I'm not saying, when I say I'm praying in faith, particularly with someone in this kind of situation, I am not saying that I am praying in faith, that I am believing as the object of my faith in a specific outcome. I am saying that the object of my faith is God and I am believing that he will act in a way that is consistent with his infinitely wise character and love. And so for the believer who does have stage four highly metastasized cancer, here's what I would say to you. I am praying that God will heal you. I believe he can heal you. I'm praying for it, and I hope he does. But I am believing and expecting, without question, that he will heal you either from death or through death. I am believing that he will heal you either from death or through death. And so either way, I'm believing you will be healed. That's what I'm praying. I am praying with faith in a God whose love and mercy never ends, who has called you before the foundation of the world to be his son or daughter, and I am praying that he will continue to act in a way that is consistent with that love towards you. And whether that be temporarily delivering you from physical death or eternally delivering you to um, eternal life. Temporary healing, eternal healing, man, you're going to be healed either way, and that's what I'm counting on. I'm counting in God. My faith is in God, not the specific Result. I can't tell you how crucial this is. There's so many people who have prayed and prayed and prayed, and they said, Well, God told me they were going to be healed. And I just, man, I thought they were going to be healed. And they didn't get healed. And then they questioned God, Where was God? He didn't love me. He let me down. And so when it comes to things that are contrary to God's revealed will, we are right to pray and hope for a yes. But it is not a lack of faith to expect a no. It's not a lack of faith. Some of you in this room may even feel guilty that someone died because you didn't have enough faith that they lived. That's not for you. That's not from God. Don't saddle yourself with that. Don't saddle yourself with that. So expect a no if it's inconsistent. Generally, we expect a no. Again, miracles happen, but generally... A no if it's inconsistent with general revelation. And then we expect a no if it's centered, if our prayers is, a prayer is centered on your convenience. If your prayer is centered on your convenience and idols. What do I mean by that? James 4 says this, You ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. There is a way for us to come to God to get what we really want. And it's not him. That's called an idol. God, I love you so much and I'm coming to you so that you'll give me the things that really satisfy my soul. I want people to love me and respect me. I want to have a great body and be beautiful. I want to have a successful career so my parents will approve of me. Whatever it is. The thing that keeps you warm at night. That's your idol. That thing that you look to to remind yourself that your life still counts. That's your idol if it's not God. And we can come to God and ask Him for those things. Asking according to our own passions. I love this. Uh, Proverbs 27, 4 says this. It's just an example of how we can use prayer to bring glory to ourselves. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. Whoever who blesses his neighbor in a loud voice, oh God, I pray that you would just rain so many blessings on them and they would be so in love and everything would go well so that they hear you praying and they're like, oh my goodness, they're so spiritual. 
They're so spiritual. God says, nope. You just prayed to yourself. You want to get the reward. Isn't this dangerous? We have a dangerous tendency to do this, right? And I think one of the most dangerous tendencies we have is to center our prayers around our own convenience and comfort, especially in America. If you don't believe me, ask yourself this question. Are the majority of your prayers essentially for your life to be easier and more comfortable? Are the majority of your prayers some version of this? Dear God, I just pray that I have a good day. I pray that things would go well for me. I pray that you would keep me from any inconvenience, discomfort, or struggle. I pray that I would avoid all suffering, annoying people, hypocrites, anything that would make my life unpleasant. God, I just pray that you would rain down your blessings so that my life goes really well and everything is smooth and I'm really happy and I get most of the things I want. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe that is such a large part of our prayer life where we see kind of prayer as a way to just get the circumstantial blessings that we want. Just make it smooth and easy. Make it nice, make it fun, make, it, make everyone happy. Don't let me suffer. Don't let me be inconvenienced. Don't let me hurt. Let me have a nice life. This is so, this, this is our, so many of our prayers. And I think if your prayer life sounds like that, you should expect a no. Because prayer is not a way to access a genie Jesus. Prayer is not a way to access a genie Jesus who just orchestrates pleasant circumstances so you can live in this pleasantville with the white picket fence. That's not what prayer is. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Jesus said, in this world, there will be tribulation. Is it not instructive, the Apostle Paul, when he prays for people who are under persecution? Not once, ever. They're being persecuted. Not once does he ever pray for their circumstances to improve. He never, you read the whole New Testament, I've read the whole thing. Never once does he say, God, I just pray they would be easier, they'd be more com comfortable, ever. What does he do? He prays for them to be strengthened in their circumstance so they witness to the glory of God. They can provide a witness to this world. Man, you take away everything from me, I still have my treasure. That's what he prays for them. That's what he's asking for them. So this is, this is crucial for us to understand. Okay, We never ever, uh, Paul never prays for those things to be easier. He prays that they would fight the good fight of faith. He, he, that's what prayer is for. Prayer is not a tool uh, for convenience. Okay, Prayer is not a way that we access like a uh, divine concierge service. Prayer is for war. I, I love how John Piper says it. Uh, he, he says, Listen to this quote. The number one reason why prayer, malfun why prayer malfunctions in the hands of, of believers is that they try to turn a wartime walkie-talkie, that is prayer, into a domestic intercom. Prayer is for the accomplishment of a wartime mission. And it's as though the field commander, Jesus, called in the troops and gave them a crucial mission, go and bear fruit, and handed, them each, of, handed each of them a personal transmitter coded to the frequency of the general's headquarters. This is prayer. And he said, comrades, the general has a mission for you. He aims to see it accomplished. And to that end, he has authorized me to give each of you personal access to him through these transmitters. And if you stay true to this mission and seek his victory first, he will always be as close as your transmitter to give tactical advice and to send in air cover when you or your comrades need it. But what have millions of Christians done? They have stopped believing that we are in a war. No urgency, no watching, no vigilance, no strategic planning. Just easy peacetime and prosperity. And what did they do with that walkie-talkie? They tried to rig it up as an intercom in their cushy houses. Not to call in firepower for conflict with a mortal enemy, but to ask the maid to bring another pillow to the den. Oh, friends, let us not use prayer as a way to try to get a smooth, easy, comfortable carriage ride. Let us use prayer as a way to access and enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit as we live for God's glory. 
So then, when it comes to prayer and expectation, I, I think you can expect God to answer your prayer with a yes if it's based on his promises and it's consistent with the way he acts in the world normally. Okay? God, pray for this pen to fall. I think you can expect that to happen. Uh, I think you can expect a no uh, if your prayer contradicts God's word is inconsistent with general revelation, or is fundamentally for just your life to be better, easier, happier, no problems, no suffering. Not going to happen. And this all brings us to where we're going to finish today, and that is, what about the wait answer? The wait. That's the, that's the hardest one. Because yes, the, the yes answer sounds like this. Yes. The no answer sounds like this. No. The wait answer sounds like this. Ugh. Right? So what about the wait answer? One hope in your notes. As we wait, we hope and we know that the God of all the earth will do right. The God of all the earth will do right. Some of you in this room right now, you're praying for people. You're praying for their salvation. They're not saved. They don't know Jesus. You're praying for them to be healed. They're not healed yet. And our hope is this. Abraham says it to God when he's pleading with him not to destroy the righteous and the wicked in Sodom. He says, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? In Genesis 18, 25. And I just want to plead with you that as you wait, as you wait, you would trust in God's character and faithfulness and goodness and love. And on what basis can you do that? Well, very simply, we can know God hears us and he cares. Why? We know God hears us because one day he didn't hear Jesus. There was a day where God did not hear Jesus so that there would never be a day when he doesn't hear you. On the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Christ was forsaken on the cross, so that you will never be forsaken. I don't want for one second to try to give easy answers to why some of the things have happened in your life, but it's not because God doesn't love you. This is what he was willing to do in order to be with you. Crush his son. What would you be willing to crush your son for? Execute your son for? God was willing to execute his son so that you could be in right relationship with him. It can't be because he doesn't love you. And he hears our prayers. When I say our prayers, I mean, I do mean prayers of believers. Uh, I remember talking to one, and this is where I'll close, and I talked to one of my youth when I was a youth pastor. We were playing ping pong. I think I've shared this. And he was an unbeliever, claimed to be an unbeliever. And he said, yeah, I pray to God every night. And I said, well, Travis, I mean, have you trusted Christ for your salvation? No. Then you don't have any reason to believe that God's going to hear your prayers in like an answer them sort of way. Because you don't have God as Father. At this moment, you do not relate to God as Father. Why? Because you haven't trusted in Christ. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that we get saved by, by being better or trying to have better morals and stop cussing. I'm going to stop smoking weed. I'm going to stop doing all these things. I'm going to become a better person. I'm going to adopt some orphans. I'm going to start going to church on Sunday. I'm going to really clean my life up, and then God will accept me. That's not the gospel. The future version of you is still not good enough. It's still not good enough. We've fallen short of God's perfect standard. And the only way that we can be reconciled to God is through the perfect life and death of another we say it a lot around New Century. When you stand before God, when it comes to salvation, there's only two kinds of people. People who are going to be judged for the life that they lived or people who are going to be judged for the life that's some, based on the life that someone else lived. And you want the second one. Because the life that you live wasn't perfect, wasn't good enough, wasn't righteous. But there was one whose life was. He lived the life that you and I were supposed to live but didn't. Then he died the sacrificial death that you and I were supposed to die, but don't have to, so that we can be united to God. And our only hope to be reconciled to God is to have the righteousness of another credited to us. So that when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Are you hoping in that this morning? 
When you think about standing for God, what are you hoping in? Are you hoping that you did your devotion this week? Are you hoping that you're going to do better next month? That's not going to be good enough. I'm just telling you. Our only hope before God is in a life we didn't live and a death we didn't die to represent us and cover us in perfect righteousness. That's what we're hoping in. That's what we're hoping in. We pray with me, God, thank you so much that we have this kind of hope. Thank you so much that you've sent Christ to live for us and die for us. God, I pray for anyone with, in the sound of my voice who might be attempting a self-salvation project through moral and ethical refurbishment, through trying harder in, in, in an attempt to somehow earn your favor. God, I pray that you would show them that will never be enough. If it could be, Christ didn't have to die on the cross. We say that Christ has come to live on our behalf and die on our behalf because nothing else would do. We can't save ourselves. And so, God, I pray that you would produce repentance and faith, that we would turn from our sin and trust Christ. Trust Christ to save us. Not in ourselves, not in our potential, but in the work of person of Christ. God, I pray that as we think about prayer, you would help us pray biblically. You would help us pray in a way that is consistent with your word, consistent with how you've revealed yourself in your world. And God, I'm not, not so naive to think that there aren't people listening right now who have prayed and prayed and prayed for an illness to go away or prayed and prayed and prayed for someone else, for someone else's illness or for their salvation and the prayer has yet to be answered. God, I pray that you would, they would not be driven to despair. I pray that in the spirit of Isaiah 62 that they would take no rest and give you no rest and they would keep praying as you've called them to. Keep praying and keep hoping. We trust you, God. We know that you're good. We say corporately that you are worthy of praise and you are worthy of worship. So strengthen our faith in you as we pray in faith for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in our lives. In Jesus' good name.